Hey, thanks for watching another video from WeldingTipsAndTricks.com. I'm Jody Collier. And I'm Andrew Cotton. One of the most common pipe welding tests out there is a 6-inch Schedule 80 with a 6010 root. We're just doing the root pass today. Got the piece all set up and locked into place. Starting off with 80 amps. We're going to tack weld it. A good idea is to pay attention to your amperage while you're tacking. It gives you a little bit of a hint whether you're too low or too high. Arc force is going to be set on 50% for this. This is a ESOB Rebel 285, by the way. Fit up is 332 gap, 332 land with 35 degree bevels. And the gap and the land all can change if the bevel's not 35 degrees. If it was a 30 degree bevel, for instance, uh, the gap might be a little wider, the land might be a little bit less. It just depends on the bevel a lot. So the tax did seem a little cold at 80. We bumped it up to 85. And now we're about ready to get started. All tack wells are feathered with a grinder first. This is the very bottom tack at six o'clock. Getting ready to light up middle of the tack and then heat it up and gradually take it on up to that very end that's been feathered and you'll hear it punch through. And you, you wanna really keep that thing jammed in there. And it's just a little whip and pause here. Now there's a lot of techniques that work here. You don't have to whip and pause. Some people like to just kind of drag it in there. Uh, some people use a little bit of a circular motion, but this is what Andrew's doing today. Seems to be working out just fine at 85 amps. I didn't get a shot of it right here. I'll show you later a, a good shot of tying into a tack. So you need to be able to light up on a tack, heat it up, and bust through right there at the end. And then you also need to be able to tie in. And the two are slightly different, but we'll get a good shot of it later. Again, just warming that tack up, keeping the arc good and tight and then when you get right close to that end of the tack you'll hear it you'll hear it make a different sound sort of like a snorkeling sound on the inside of the pipe and you can really learn a lot just by paying attention to the way a, a root pass sounds like this another thing I want you to notice is Andrew's arm as he's as he's coming up the pipe he's changing the rod angle moving his arm trying to keep that rod pointed pretty much toward the center of the pipe now you can make minor adjustments uh, in your rod angle to help cool the puddle off or to help heat it up and that's just something that sort of comes with practice but good rule of thumb is just to try to try to be straight in toward the center if you'll in your mind's eye always be pointing the rod toward the center of the pipe you should be close you'll always be off a little bit you always have more angle than you really think it's hard to tell when that when that hood is down going to get a little bit of a, a grinding of make sure that tack is feathered good before we tie into it at the very top. It's time for the other side. Now notice how Andrew is propping there. He's just got, got his left hand holding onto the stand to sort of steady his body up and then he's freewheeling with his right hand so he can move it all over the place. Now the, the arc is about to bust through here. There it is. That was when I was talking about heating the tack up, keeping a good tight arc, and then when you get close to the very end of that tack, it'll, it'll keyhole bust through keep it good and tight, keep it poked in there, keep the rod pointed toward the center of the pipe. Now here's a shot of tying into a tack. About half inch away now. You don't want to do anything different. You want to, do want to make sure you have enough rod to tie in and you don't run out right here. But pushing right in and, and melting that tack away and just pushing that keyhole right into the, the tack until it closes up. And then once it closes up, don't come out right away or you'll leave a crater most likely. Just keep on Keep on up to the thicker part of the tack before you whip out. One more quarter or quadrant to do here. Pay attention to how Andrew's kind of got the rod Q-sticked lightly. That's to steady up to get a good arc start, not to leave any arc strikes on the pipe. You kind of want to put light pressure on it so that you can let go of it nice and easily without moving the rod. So once you get started and get steadied, you get everything going your way, get the keyhole going, then you kind of turn loose of that and then steady up with that other hand or just let it hang at your side or whatever but that's a common technique especially for pipe liners uh, just to get a good a good start steadies up the rod and uh, it's not completely necessary but it sure does help preventing arc strikes like if you're taking a test where an arc strike will fail you you don't want to take any chances on having an arc strike outside of the the bevels kind of just coaxing it along at 6010 is just kind of chewing out the, those lands and uh, breaking the walls down 
and you're kind of chewing metal away and then backing up and filling it in. And if you got your amperage right, it goes pretty good. If, you, if you're too hot, the keyhole will get too big on you, get out of hand. And if you've got it too cold, you, you'll barely have a keyhole. But again, that just comes with practice. Melting into the tack again. Not going to rush it. Going to take two or three more steps before whipping out and get on up to the thick part of that tack. And that's a root. Let's take a look at it after a wire wheel on the inside. This is the bottom at 6 o'clock. We'll pan on upwards uphill. All right, there's the side tack there at, at uh, 3 o'clock. Coming on up to 12 o'clock-ish on the other side. Even though this is poked through pretty good, after the hot pass and fill passes, a lot of times it'll push through even further. Okay, coming soon will be the part two. will be a fill-in cap with 7018, a two-bead cap. But for this video, I just wanted to focus on the route. If you've got a 6G test in your future, first of all, I want to wish you luck. I'm going to show a few other clips of 6G route passes with TIG. I'm going to try to link them up right here if YouTube will let me put that many links on there. But a uh, 2 inch monster coupon, TIG route, 2 inch schedule 80 uh, with 309 route, and then some walk in the cup info, and then also some socket weld info some, from previous videos that I've done. Again, I'll try to link them up right here. Hey, good luck. This is a 6G monster coupon test. This test is given to provide a wider range of qualifications, both on diameter and wall thickness. And one way to do it is a dip keyhole method. In this case, I'm using a 332 rod with about a 532 gap. A lot of different configurations there. Some people would back feed it, but the, the main goal is to put a little reinforcement in there on the bottom half. The top half is pretty easy. Gravity will take care of it. But on something fairly small like this, you're constantly having to sort of reposition and roll your wrist. And it's sort of a good idea to use a technique that travels somewhat slowly. It gives you a little bit of time to reposition and readjust. Now, I'm using a TIG finger there. This thing can get kind of warm, especially if you weld the root and then come right back over it with the hot pass after just a few minutes. And sometimes there are time limits, time constraints on a, on a test like this. So, you know, sometimes you need all the tools in your tool belt that you can that you can get. This video was a 6 inch schedule 80 and I used the uh, lay wire technique here. So 8 inch gap, 8 inch rod, no land, and I'm just doing a forward and back type motion. No side to side motion at all. That usually works pretty good. Side to side motion sometimes on lay wire on the bottom can cause a real flat or even a suck back root. So usually just I usually just go straight forward and back. Now if you can't swap hands, uh, you can always prop like I'm doing here. I'm on the side that I normally would swap to my left hand, but hey, I can do the bottom half of this just fine, just like this, and then step over the other half of it for the top. If you don't feel comfortable with your left hand, you know, do something different. In this video, I was using a 309 filler rod. Oftentimes, tests are given using a carbon steel coupon, but 309 filler rod that's just the way it's done. That's in compliance with the code, usually uh, ASME or ANSI Section 9. And so I'm dipping and keyholing. This one's got a purge on the inside. Same thing, though. You want to push a little rod in each dip so that you get some reinforcement on the bottom half. Again, top kind of takes care of itself on something like this. Some test shops want you to be able to walk the cup. So this is a little tutorial on walking the cup. Again, I'll try to link the video up right here. Walking the cup is akin to rolling a 55-gallon drum across a shop floor where you roll it back and forth in sort of a figure-eight motion. Very much the same thing. It's all about light pressure. It's all about having the right extension on your electrode, choosing the right cup size, and then just getting those motor skills built where it feels comfortable. In this case, I was just welding on some really heavy wall stainless tubing, uh, just what I happen to have around. Some jobs don't want you to walk the cup, or they won't want you to walk the cup in the test shop. It just all depends. Most of the time, you can do either or. But if you can't walk the cup, you need to learn how to freehand. And again, this thing's getting rather warm, so you saw me prop on the very end with, uh, with the TIG finger. And then I can prop and not worry about that and focus on welding instead of how hot my finger is. Once you get on a job, you're likely to have to do some socket welds. So they're pretty easy compared to a, a 6G test, but... Anything one inch and below, it's kind of tough to walk the cup on, so I usually freehand. And when you freehand, things get really hot again. Sometimes there's no place to prop, and you have to prop pretty much on the fitting or a few inches away from it. So it just helps. Tig Finger and a Tig Finger XL, 
They're my products, 100% sourced and assembled in the USA. There are knockoffs out there, but these are the genuine TIG fingers. If you're interested in learning more, just visit weldmonger.com. That is how I support these videos. Thanks for watching. Thanks for your support.